Hey guys, what's up? It's Dante and welcome back to my channel. The first thing I want to say, I'm sorry if the lighting is like really crappy. It's currently like 3.34 ish when I'm filming this video. So the sun is going to be setting and the sun just so happens to be right behind me. So it will be kind of flashing in and out. I'm very sorry for that. Just like get that out in the open. The second thing I wanted to say is, guys, I've changed my name. I know this video is going to come out, like, a week or two after I changed my name officially, but, like, I just want to announce it, like, publicly, like, yes, I did. So, my new name is going to be Astral Dante, which is paying homage to my love of space. And I know it has absolutely nothing to do with this channel. I just really like space, and the word astral means relating to the stars, so I feel like it's just kind of a cool name. I don't really know. So, my name is going to be Astral Dante on YouTube. I'm just going to call myself Dante, though, because... Yeah, but I want to make myself easier to find because if you just type in Dante, it's like really hard to find me. So yeah, so we're gonna go with Astral Dante. It's gonna be a vibe. I might change it back. Who knows? But yeah, it's gonna go with the whole space theme of my channel. Cool? Okay, cool. So the third thing I want to say is, guys, I know I say this in every video, but like my Instagram and Twitter are linked down below. If you guys are interested in following me on any of those platforms, please do so. I say this in every single video because it's so true. Guys, I want to start doing, like, Twitter polls. Like I said, I have three videos already pre-filmed and ready to go. I would love to do a Twitter poll and see what of the three videos you guys want to see drop first, drop second, and third, because I'm totally open to switching around my order of the videos. So, yeah. So that would be super cool and fun. Okay, guys. So, hopefully that intro wasn't too, too long. I'm kind of trying to shorten them down really quickly and try to, you know, get everything I have to say out super fast. So I hope I did that, and yeah, let's get into today's video. So today's video is going to be on the case of James Bird Jr. So when I was researching this case, I actually found this case in a very uh, different manner than I usually do. A lot of my cases I have prior knowledge of, and I kind of go based off cases that have interested me in the past. But this case, I actually wanted to focus on hate crime. So I was actually on a giant list of hate crime related crimes and I found this case and when I had read the like little synopsis of it I was truly horrified which means I needed to do a video on this because I felt like it needed to be heard again and again and again because it was just truly horrific and it's actually really scary to think that this case happened only 20 years ago and not in like 1920 because when you hear the details of this case you will probably be as traumatized as I was. So yeah guys, let's get into today's case of James Bird Jr. So in every single one of my videos I like to start off by saying who was James? So James was born on May 2nd of 1949 in Beaumont, Texas. His parents were named Stella May and James Bird Sr. and together they had eight children. Both of his parents worked in the church. Religion was a huge part of their life. I couldn't find a lot on James's childhood, but I do know that in his childhood he had a huge interest in the piano and making music in general, and that was something that he had a lot of fun doing. He was also described as being a really, really nice kid and someone that a lot of people got along with. He ended up graduating from Jasper Rowe High School in 1967, which was the last segregated class for that school in Texas. After he left college, he married pretty quick and he ended up having three children. His main job and occupation was a vacuum salesman. Not everything though was picture perfect for James's life and he did actually struggle with alcoholism. And this was something that a lot of people in his life said put a very big strain on his relationship with his family and mainly his wife. He also turned to petty larceny and he did end up being caught and needed to serve jail time for his crimes. Eventually his wife couldn't take this anymore and she decided to divorce from him in 1993. In 1996 James wanted to turn around his life and he actually ended up going to Alcoholics Anonymous which I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what that is. It's basically a meeting space where alcoholics can meet and talk about their journey to sobriety and it's kind of like a support group for alcoholics. So he went there to try to change his life because he realized that alcoholism was the root of his problems and so he wanted to change that and so he was you know on the path to making his life better however he still did have days where he fell back and started drinking again overall though his family described him as a really good father and grandfather and someone who was kind and musically gifted you guys so now we're going to go into what ended up happening to james bird so on june 7th of 1998 James was visiting his parents' house and he needed a ride home because I guess maybe he was dropped off. I don't think he had his own car and he was slightly intoxicated. However, when he was walking back home, three men, one that he did know, approached him. Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John King. And they offered to give him a ride back to his house. 
James happily accepted as obviously you don't want to walk home if you have a ride available. So he did end up getting in the car with the three men. And he did actually know Sean Barry as they were acquaintances and had met I think once or twice before this. However, the three men did not drive him home and instead the three men turned away and drove actually in the opposite direction from his house. They took him to a rural county outside of the county which they were all from. Once they arrived, James had gotten a bad feeling in his stomach and he knew something wasn't right as why would the three men be taking him to a deserted location and then you know all of them getting out of the car and going to his door. So James tried to hold on as long as he could to the car door because he didn't want them to open it because he knew something bad was going to happen but James was actually intoxicated on this night and so he didn't really wasn't able to put up much of a fight to be honest and so the two men were able to easily pull the door open. Now there's some confusion and no one really knows for sure obviously what happened except James Bird. Sean Barry did go on record after his arrest and kind of explain some of the situation and so a lot of the information that we have is from him and what he describes. So I mean take that what you will because he does actually put a lot of the blame on the other two men. So after they dragged James out of the car, Bill King then said, F it. Let's kill this n-word. Brewer and King then took turns beating and stomping on James's face and head. Barry claims that he had little to do with the actual assault and he was just kind of waiting off to the side while they were the two ones that were attacking and brutally maiming James. Barry also claims that during the assault the two men were laughing and joking as if this was some fun sick game to them and they were actually seeming to enjoy what they were doing and had a lot of fun doing it. They also had black spray paint in their car which they took out and sprayed onto his face as well as defecating and urinating on top of him. When they were finished with the actual assault they then chained his ankles to the truck, drove around for three miles, dragging James behind them on the chains. The men also claim that they slit his throat before they decided to drag him around from the truck. However, upon looking at the autopsy, the detectives and the mortician, whoever performs autopsy, decided that the evidence just did not back up this theory and it was way more likely that they just dragged James alive. Forensic evidence also showed that for the first mile and a half, James had tried to keep his head up from the ground and shield it from the rocks that were hitting him and from the asphalt itself. In fact, James was only officially confirmed dead when the car slammed and hit a curb and then his body slammed into a culvert, which I had to look up a culvert. It's basically like a drainage pipe. And because the truck was going so fast and his body hit this culvert at such high velocity, it did actually decapitate him and sever his right arm off of his body completely. And they were actually just left right next to that drain pipe. They did continue to drive actually for another mile with his headless torso still attached. During the autopsy, it also was revealed that his skull and brain were completely intact, which means that he was completely conscious up until the decapitation when he was finally killed. So during, for the first mile and a half of this ride, he was still alive. The men then stopped driving in front of a black owned church in a very prominently black neighborhood. And so they dropped off his headless torso, which also didn't have his right arm, in front of the church. And then afterwards they headed off to a barbecue, like they had not just savagely murdered and beat a man and dropped off his body like he didn't matter. The following morning, a nearby motorist had found James's decapitated arm and head laying on the side of the road. And so he obviously called the police because he found a body. And so the police had completely sectioned off the three mile area because they had to investigate because they saw blood, they saw pieces of James laying all over the place. So on their search of the three mile long strip, they had found a wrench with the name Barry written on it. And they had also found a lighter with the name Possum on it. And Possum was actually King's nickname from prison. So that's why he used that nickname. Overall, the police had tagged 81 separate places which contained James's remains of the three mile stretch where he was dragged. Due to the horrific and brutal nature of the crime, the FBI was also called in only 24 hours after discovering the body because they knew that they would need backup for this case because it was truly such a horrific crime. Through their investigating, they were able to quickly apprehend the three men. And during their investigation into the three men, they uncovered that Brewer and King were openly white supremacists. And actually, when they were in prison, they had joined hate groups and white supremacist groups. So in prison, they actually have white supremacist gangs and groups. I have no idea why I keep saying groups, I mean gangs. And these two men, Brewer and King, were actually a part of these 
groups when they were in jail. So obviously when they were doing their investigation and they saw that they were a part of these white supremacist groups and just the brutal nature of the crime in general, this crime was determined a hate crime and hate crimes um, carry a lot more punishment than a normal crime does. I wanted to add in here a little bit more information about hate crimes. So according to the Oxford Dictionary, a hate crime is a crime, typically one involving violence, that is motivated by prejudice on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, or other grounds. So the reason why hate crimes are really important to categorize as a hate crime and not just like a normal crime, so like in this case, a murder versus a hate crime murder, is that people will feel more motivated or able to commit these crimes if they learn that somebody else committed a crime based on hate. They want to show people, like in America, like the, the justice system wants to show people that it is not okay to commit crimes, I mean in general obviously, but especially because of just hate over someone that you don't know just based on their skin, their sexual orientation, their religion, or really anything. So that's kind of why hate crimes have to be more specific because they want to stop hate in general, especially when it comes to um, being involved in the crime. On King's body, they also noticed several tattoos that had racist and white supremacist meanings. So for example, one included a man who was black being lynched from a tree, and this was tattooed on his body. I literally have to jump on here again just to say how when I was literally saying that out loud, I could not get over how insane of a thought that is to literally tattoo a fucking hate crime on your body a literal racist act of somebody losing their life like i literally cannot wrap my mind around the the thought of why somebody would do that like hate crimes in general are so crazy to me i don't understand them but the fact that somebody would ever get that done on them is just such an insane thought to me i literally cannot process it. Sorry, I just wanted to like add that in. It, I was like off in this clip because I literally just could not understand why somebody would want to do that. He had a few other Nazi symbols as his tattoos and he also had the words Aryan pride written on his body, which if you don't know what that means, the word Aryan pride comes from the Holocaust, which I'm like 95% sure pretty much everyone who's watching this videos knows what the Holocaust is and was and knows that Aryan pride basically means like Nazi pride and it's a, the word Aryan means blue-eyed blonde hair and that's basically associated with what Hitler was trying to do with his racial purification. So we had that written on his body. So obviously the three men were imprisoned and sent to jail because they had to wait out for their trial now and they were in jail during this. And I think due to the brutal nature of the crime, they weren't offered bail or if they were offered bail, it was too high for them to pay. So one of the men had actually written a letter from prison and they sent it out to one of their friends on the outside. And this letter talked about how exciting the crime was to commit and that he knew while committing it that he probably would have to get the death penalty due to the brutal nature of the crime, but he said that he was okay with this and that this crime was too important and that he had to commit it. His letter was quoted as saying, regardless of the outcome of this, we have made history, death before dishonor, which I actually didn't know what that meant, but that means so each of the men ended up being tried for their part in the crime. So the first man up for trial was Sean Barry. So Sean Barry, in his interview, had actually given a lot of information forward, and most of the information they have is from him because he was more open to talking. He claims that he had a more limited role in this murder and that it was more so the other two men, so Brewer and King, who were more invested in this murder and who were actually white supremacists. So he was convicted and found guilty of capital murder but due to him kind of taking a plea deal and being a witness against his own friends, he was able to not receive the death penalty and he will actually be eligible for parole on June of 2038 when he will be 63 years old. So I didn't mention this, but when these men committed the crimes, they were all in their very early 20s. Now obviously this man is still in jail. J Sean Barry is still in prison to this day. And he lost his entire life due to this crime, which I'm not saying is not warranted. Obviously, I think that is justice. However, just think of how crazy that is. Because of his crime on one night, he lost the rest of his life because of the hate that he allowed. Now, he says he didn't, you know, participate in this crime, but he still watched it and let it occur. And a man lost his life because of him. So, you know, it's just crazy to think, like, they were all in their 20s and their life cut completely from them. So one of the other men, Lawrence Brewer, actually received the death penalty for his crime. And one of the main reasons why he received this, obviously besides the brutal nature of his crime and his white supremacist relations, he was interviewed by a psychiatrist who deemed that he had absolutely no regret or sympathy for his crime. And in a quote, 
in 2011, he actually said, as far as any regrets go, no, I have no regrets. No, I'd do it all over again to tell you the truth. So he was actually put to death later that day after that quote because that was the final, that was basically the final interview he had before his death. And so that just shows you like even, this was 2011, so even 15 or so years after his murder, he still had no regrets and no remorse for what he did. So obviously this was a man that was not going to be able to change. And so he was put to death for his crimes. John King was also sentenced and convicted of capital murder, and he was also sentenced to death for his part in the crime. And I think that one of the reasons for him specifically was his ties to the white supremacist groups as well. Something interesting though is that during his trial, and actually after his trial, King tried to justify what he did by saying that his time in prison completely changed him and made him into a white supremacist. Because he claims that the reason he was so brutal during this attack was because when he was in jail for his for his crimes um, a couple years before this murder, he was actually sexually assaulted by black men uh, many times, he claims, and so that is kind of what made him have this racism towards black men. And he tried to justify that, however, the court completely threw that away and said, that absolutely does not justify what you did to this innocent man who you didn't know. You just chose him because of his skin color. He also tried to appeal his death sentence conviction uh, a few years, I believe, before he was sentenced to death. However, the court threw this away and said, no, you will be sentenced to death for your part in this crime. And so, on April 24th of 2019, John King was given the lethal injection. So obviously, the reaction to this crime was huge, as many people were disgusted by what happened. Many people had deemed James's death a modern-day lynching, and a lot of people were saying it was very reminiscent to the early-day lynchings of the 20th century, from the early years of the 20th century. And a lot of people said that they thought we had grown as a society, over the course of a hundred years, but I guess in 1998, there is still so much racism in some people that they think it's okay to do this to people who they don't know, just based off their skin color. This murder also brought a lot of attention to white supremacist groups. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of white supremacist gangs in prison. Now, a lot of people that join those gangs are obviously white supremacists, but there are a portion that aren't and just do it for the protection that being in a prison gang will give you. So this case showed how detrimental being in one of these gangs in prison can be because you're taught when you're in prison for however long your sentence is that everyone who's not white is the enemy. And so when people are released from jail, they are filled with this anger and hate and they do horrible crimes just like this to people who don't look like them. And so that is why, you know, these gangs in prison are a huge problem. And I mean, obviously, obviously they're a huge fucking issue because they spread hate, obviously, but I'm just saying like, this is why they are dangerous even to people that aren't in prison, because they still bring their hate from prison outside into the real world, and then this is how crimes like this happen. The Sisters of James also created the James Bird Foundation to aid in racial healing after this crime. Now. Obviously, I mean, even to this day, there are still racially motivated crimes happening, so this foundation was kind of supposed to be a resource where people can try to heal after, you know, being a victim of a hate crime or try to learn about why hate crimes are so awful and why people don't deserve the treatment that James got. And so I think it's a really noble cause that they made this foundation because there are still people out there who think racism and hate crimes are okay. And that's a really, really scary thought. Now, this is actually super interesting because I didn't know this, but I think I actually did reference James Byrd in an earlier case that I had done with the Matthew Shepard case, if you guys know what that case is. It is, I'm not gonna go into it, but it's basically another hate crime against a gay individual. And so in, I think it was 2009, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was actually able to be passed. And so I thought it was super interesting how a previous case I did and this case currently kind of combined to create this legislation against hate crimes. And so obviously this legislation is just supposed to expand the definition of what is considered a hate crime and, and try to get stricter punishments for people who do commit hate crimes. And so this was passed, obviously, again, with the case of Matthew Shepard, both of them together were kind of like helped let this legislation be passed, which is super interesting. So yeah, guys, that is the case of James Byrd Jr. I hope you guys learned something from this case. And it's honestly, when I was researching it, it was super crazy to realize like this case was not that long ago. Like yes, 1998 seems super far away, but it really wasn't. It was just 20 years ago. I mean, a lot of our parents were alive during this case. And to think that people were so bold enough to commit openly racist acts and crimes and murders against other people is so scary. I mean, for me, it's like, I didn't know about stuff like that you know, happened that recently up until now. And so this is really an eye-opening case that people are still filled with such racist ideology and bigotry. I mean, even look at Lawrence Brewer who said in 2011 that he would do it again. So the fact that in 2011 his ideology still did not change shows you that 
people even in 2010, I mean even now, are so racist that they would kill people just based off the color of their skin, which is such a horrific thing to think about. And hate crimes in general really spook me, especially when I was young. I never understood how somebody could have so much hate that they would want to take away somebody's life because they lived differently than them. And of something they couldn't control, which is truly just sad, and I feel awful for people who commit hate crimes as well because imagine living with that much hate. It's it's unthinkable. But yeah guys, that is this case. Thank you so much again for listening. I love you all so 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 much. Please, uh, if you guys have cases that you want me to cover, please use the little box below. I do go through them. I actually have added a lot of them to my um, list. I have a giant list of cases that I want to cover in the next couple weeks. So yeah guys, thank you and I will see you in the next one. Bye!